Welcome to Groundswell Online. My name is Taylor. I'm so glad that you are joining us today wherever you're tuning in from. I hope you're having a great summer so far. It's been awesome. And I just wanna let you know about a few things that are happening here at Groundswell this summer or the weeks ahead that you can stay in the loop about and maybe join in on. The first thing is this coming Saturday, the 22nd, from 12 to 2 p.m., we're having our monthly community dinner. So this is a free community dinner that we put on at our Print Street location in Truro. So if you or anyone that you know of could benefit from that, a free meal um, and just a, a fun and loving environment um, with people and community, if that's something you could benefit from or someone you know, invite them. It's happening on the 22nd at our Print Street location from 12 to 2 p.m. The next thing I wanna let you know about, and this is specifically for all the youth out there, so anyone going into grade six to 12, we are having our second Nerf night at the church, so 759 Print Street in Truro, on the 24th of July. It's a Monday night from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. We're gonna have a Nerf night. We had one of these in the winter. It was so much fun. And it's pretty much what, you, what it sounds like. It's a night where we have a Nerf battle in the church and it's awesome and it's so much fun. We're gonna have snacks, we're gonna have food. Um, so bring your Nerf blaster, we'll provide the bullets, we'll provide some of the fun and hijinks of the night, keep you on your toes and it's gonna be fun. So invite a friend, um, you can register in the link in the description box below. We just wanna get to know who's coming. It's free of charge, but make sure you register and let us know that you're coming. It's gonna be a great night. That's all for me. Um, we're gonna head into the rest of our online service today. Let me just pray for us as we head into that. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you um, for everyone that's tuning in today. I, God, I just pray you would use this message. You would use this online service to speak to people, to reach hearts of those that are watching. God, we want to know you. We want to take us up closer to you. So I pray that you would give courage to those that are tuning in today to really tune in and give you their undivided attention and take a step closer to you today. We thank you, Lord. Um, I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. If we haven't met before, my name is Tammy. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for joining us. Um, we should have put one of those little white boxes up here on this stage, because it's a little more toasty up here, I think, under the lights. Um, I'm just gonna make one little adjustment here. Okay. Um, Jeremy mentioned last week that for the month of July, we're doing what we call one-offs. So what that really means is we don't have a, a particular series that we're all following. But I uh, am on for the next two Sundays, this Sunday, next Sunday. Then you get to hear from Taylor, which is gonna be a treat. And then I'll be back the next Sunday. So while I am speaking in our one-offs section, I decided that I actually kind of wanted to do my own series, I guess, sort of. Um, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell Jeremy or Taylor. So they're just following along with me. Um, but I, I really feel, I really felt compelled that we were at a, real, a certain space and... I really wanted to kind of address that. So that's what I'm going to be doing over the next couple of weeks. But before we get there, uh, what I want to ask you a question this morning. If somebody asked you what your best day ever was, would you have an answer? Like, could you think of something immediately right off the top of your head that you would consider to be your best day ever? And for some of us, maybe that is an event like um, wedding or the birth of your child, like, you know, things like that. Uh, for some of us, maybe it's some incredible vacation that we went on, like, it was just, just the best day ever. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's uh, something that really changed your life, and it was the best day ever for you. What might that be for you? I, I find right now, um, during the summer, and lots of my friends are traveling, they're going to all these cool places, and of course, I'm a little bit jealous when I'm you know, watching their lives play out on social media. 
uh, on these amazing vacations. This, this one, a couple people that I follow on Instagram that I, I've met, I know, sort of, sort of. They're not like, we're not besties, but, you know, people that I know. Um, they just went to the Swiss Alps, right? Like, their videos and their photos were stunning. Like, when you talk about a mountaintop experience, literally, they were having a mountaintop experience. It was incredible. Like, and we, I think we all fantasize about mountaintop experiences, right? Like, we, we actually probably almost chase after them all the time. That, that our life could just be filled with all these amazing experiences constantly. We're chasing after them. And, and if we actually achieve a mountaintop experience, it's like we just want to stay there. We want to stay on the mountaintop. We never want to come down. Like we just, we want this to be our entire life. But life really isn't like that, right? It's not really like that. It's not non-stop, best day ever moments. And for the next couple of weeks, I actually want to spend some time talking about life in the valley. Now I know, this is a total bummer, Tammy. Like Jeremy just got up here and told us about pizza parties and Nerf wars, and now you want to talk about life in the valley? I know. It sounds like a total downer. Well, yes and no. Because the valley can be exactly the right place for something to be cultivated and to be grown. When you think about a valley, when it comes to crops and farming and growth, uh, a valley is generally more favorable for crop growth. The surrounding hills or mountains, they provide this natural protection from harsh winds that can endanger and uproot crops. Valleys also tend to trap moist air, leading to higher humidity levels, and they create this stable growing environment. Valleys often have better access to water resources compared to other topographical features. Because rainwater it r runs off these surrounding slopes and it tends to collect in the valley and form streams and rivers and, and groundwater reservoirs. Valleys are known for having nutrient-dense soil because the raw, that runoff from the mountains, it also contains nutrients and it replenishes the soil in the valley. And these surrounding mountains, they regulate the temperature, so there's this more of a constant temperature and you avoid all of the extremes. Lots of growth happens in the valley. But all too often, we miss what is available to us in the valley because we're so focused on wanting that mountaintop experience. And we struggle to see the invitation to growth that's actually right in front of us. Today I want to look at a passage uh, from the Old Testament from a book called Isaiah. Isaiah was a guy, he was a prophet. So like we now, we have the Bible that we can go to and refer to and, and learn about what God wants to teach us, but, but then they didn't have the Bible, they had prophets. And the prophets would come and they would deliver God's messages to his people. And so this passage is, it's a message delivered from the prophet Isaiah to God's people, and it's about the coming Messiah. So the Messiah was the one that they believed that was going to come and free Israel. And interestingly enough, Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, he returns to Galilee, he shows up at a Jewish synagogue on the Sabbath, so like he shows up at church. And he stands in front of everyone and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah. And he reads a section of this passage that we're going to read together today. And when, after he finishes reading it, he concludes by saying, 
The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. So he was basically standing in front of them and saying, this, this, this passage, this thing that was delivered by the prophet Isaiah, this word from God, is actually about me. And here I am. I'm here with you. So let's read what Isaiah had to say about the coming Messiah, so about Jesus. Isaiah 61 verses one to three says this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. So first I wanna look at what he doesn't say here. He doesn't say, he has sent me to the happy and the wealthy and to have everything that they want and they don't have a care in the world and everything is perfect. Doesn't say that. It says he is sent to the poor the brokenhearted, captives, prisoners, those who mourn. He sent to people who find themselves in darkness and grief and despair. And these circumstances, they're not presented as an exception. Like there isn't this big list of mountaintop experiences first. It's just presented as real life. And if Jesus came for everyone, it's saying that everyone is going to experience this. That the valleys of life should be expected. That hardship is actually normal. And that in the midst of that is where you will find Jesus. That's where he will be. Now, whether you realize it or not, the world that we live in has been whispering to you from the time you were born that happiness and and wealth and value and recognition is literally just a click or two away. That you can have everything you want the girl, the house, the vacations, you can live the mountaintop experience 24 seven, it can all be yours. But that's not entirely true. We live in a broken world, full of broken people like you and me. You will experience hard times in your life. And although so much of the messaging that we receive would want us to believe otherwise, the Bible is pretty matter of fact about it. I mean, all you have to do is read through the Psalms. The Psalms are full of prayers written in despair. People crying out to God to rescue them, to save them from the situations that they're facing. It's Psalm 88. I'm just gonna read some of the verses in Psalm 88 for you to get a picture. O Lord God of my salvation, I cry out to you by day. I come to you at night. Now hear my prayer, listen to my cry. For my life is full of troubles and death draws near. I am as good as dead, like a strong man with no strength left. They have left me among the dead, and I lie like a corpse in a grave. I am forgotten, cut off from your care. You have thrown me into the lowest pit, into the darkest depths. O Lord, I cry out to you. 
I will keep on pleading day by day, oh Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you turn your face from me? They swirl around me like floodwaters all day long. They have engulfed me completely. You have taken away my companions and loved ones. Darkness is my closest friend. That's literally the last line of this psalm. Darkness is my closest friend. Or in the original language, it actually ends with the word language. A better translation would be, my closest friend is darkness. Maybe that feels a little bit more accurate to you today. A little bit more like what you have been experiencing in your life. Like, where are you, God? Like, can't you see what I'm going through? Like, I have been begging you to take this away. Are you just gonna, just gonna leave me here? Maybe that feels more real to you than a mountaintop experience. I think sometimes um, we need to get realistic with our expectations. If our expectation for our life is that it should be this nonstop mountaintop experience, and if it isn't that, then there's something wrong, well, when the challenges of life come, when the hardship comes, when the darkness creeps in, it's going to be really hard to figure out what to do with it then. We live in a entertainment and prosperity and consumer-driven, you-can-have-it-all kind of world. But that world doesn't handle hardship very well. It doesn't actually really want hardship at all. And would definitely prefer to pretend that you can avoid it altogether. You just, you know, buy the right supplement and, you know, pay for the right exercise program. If you just click the right website. But that is not real life. In John 16, Jesus has just finished warning his followers what they're going to, that they can expect in their future. And he says this, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. He says, you will. This isn't, there's it's no, it's no guess here. He says, you will have it. You will have trials. You will have sorrows. It's, it's not an if, it's a when. Jesus is telling them this is going to be common. It's going to be normal. It's going to be part of regular, everyday life. We've been fed this idea that if you are prosperous and your life appears to have been easy, then you are hashtag blessed. Or somebody seems to have this happy life and they're well off according to whatever, then we're like, oh, they're really blessed. But if you have a difficult life somehow, then then sometimes we, we wonder, oh, is there, like, maybe there's something wrong with them. You know, they, they must have done something that has caused this, that, that's bringing this on them. Or maybe you've even thought about it, thought about yourself that way. You know, you've asked the question, what did I do to deserve this? Like, why am I being punished? Why is, is he living the good life and nothing ever works out for me? But both of these ideas, the hashtag blessed life and the you must be being punished in your life, 
They completely break down, they completely fall apart when we look at the life of Jesus. Jesus was not a prosperous guy. Jesus didn't live in palaces. Jesus didn't have fancy chariots. Jesus lived a life of modesty and borderline poverty. He did, definitely did not live a life of ease. Jesus also lived a life experiencing great hardship and suffering. Earlier in Isaiah chapter 53, Jesus is described as a man of sorrows acquainted with the deepest grief. So if we're going to allow those superstitious ideas of blessing and cursing to work, then what are we going to say to Jesus? He was not prosperous, he was a man of sorrows. What are we going to say to him? Are we going to say, well, Jesus, I guess God doesn't really love you or favor you. I don't think we're going to say that. And if he's a man of sorrow, are we going to say, well, Jesus, I guess God is unhappy with you. Like maybe he's punishing you for something that you did. Not likely. We're not likely going to say that. And although we may not say them out loud, I think we harbor these thoughts and ideas in our hearts. If something is really going bad in our life, we wonder, like, is God punishing me for something? Do I not have enough faith? Maybe I don't have enough faith. You know, if I just had enough faith, maybe things would be better. But neither of those ideas hold up in the biblical narrative. The idea that God is punishing you if things are hard in your life, it also doesn't hold up in the life of Jesus. Who had more faith than Jesus? I wonder what Jesus would say if somebody said to him, hey, Jesus, the reason this is so hard is because God is punishing you because you didn't have enough faith. Or, hey, Jesus, the reason things aren't getting better is because you lack faith. When Jesus teaches about faith, he doesn't actually teach in terms of quantity, like how much do you have? He teaches in terms of direction, as in who are you placing your faith in? He almost teaches the opposite of quantity, actually. Um, he, he talks about faith uh, as big as a mustard seed, which is like a mustard seed is tiny. It's like the size of a sesame seed or even smaller. It says, you, if you even have that much faith, then remarkable things can happen. So he's kind of reversing this idea of quantity, that you need more faith in order for God to actually respond to your prayers. It's not a matter of how much. It's a matter of who it's in. And that's what I think Jesus wants to call our attention to. You see, ours is the only religion with a cross. Christianity is the only religion where the one that we follow died a horrible death, who suffered excruciating pain, who lived a life where things didn't go right, all the time, where the world was against him. Ours is the only religion where the central figure demonstrates the reality of suffering. As far as hardship is concerned, it's not if it's going to happen in your lives, it's more like when when it does. 
You know, some of us look at people who seem to have it all together for a variety of reasons, and they're experiencing suffering too. They're experiencing hardships. Here's where Isaiah 61 um, takes a shift and invites us into this deep, beautiful teaching. At the beginning and at the end of the passage that I read, in the opening of chapter 61, he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Now, if you were talking about God in your darkest moment, would sovereign be the word that you use to explain him? Or would you use words like angry, missing, not with me, absent, the where are you God in the midst of my suffering? But Isaiah, he uses sovereign Lord. And it's like, it's a, it's a faith vision that God is sovereign, that nothing happens in my life that is beyond his grasp. And of course, that is really hard for us to understand in the midst of something very painful and dark and difficult when you're questioning why is this happening. And we won't always have answers to that. But we do get promises. Promises that no matter what we are facing, God will not leave you or forsake you. It's a promise. He will always be present with you. And when you come to him, when you meet him in the valley, there's actually an opportunity for something beautiful to grow. See, what Isaiah is teaching us is that the way out is actually in. It's not the way around. It's not us clamoring to climb up on our own, to get up over that mountain, to get out of the valley. It's not around. It's not up and over. It's actually through. And one of the most beautiful and profound aspects of life with Jesus is that when you enter into these difficult places, he meets us there. He meets us there. But we have to meet him too. It's in the valley that things grow is in the valley that things can be cultivated in us, where he can remake us in ways that don't actually happen in ordinary days. They happen in the dark. They happen in the pressure. They happen in the pain and the confusion where nothing seems to be going right. He meets us there. And the promise is that he won't waste the pain that you're experiencing. No matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, in the valleys and in the shadows, the way out is in. It's to seek intimacy with the Lord. And over time, he will begin to make you new. The end of that passage that I read says, to all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown, beauty for ashes. Love that line a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair, in their righteousness, so in their right relationship with God. 
they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. Another translation says, there will be oaks of righteousness. That when we are in right relationship with God, when we seek him in the valley, we will be able to withstand the tests of time like a beautiful oak tree. Withstand the weather and the hardship that we will be able to endure. That the roots of our righteousness, our right relationship with God, that's found in our belonging with Jesus, because it, it's a gift given by Jesus, that we, we will be expansive that our roots will be expansive and and it will secure us against all the storms that come at us because the storms will come and they will keep coming. And for some of you, you're like, this has been my whole life. I feel like the storms just come and come and come and come. And the invitation to you in that is intimacy with the Lord who will make your roots deep, strong, and enduring, able to withstand whatever hardship is thrown at you. So here's why I wanna spend my one-offs on this topic. I know that many of you are walking in the valley. You are deep in the darkness. It feels overwhelming. It feels like you'll never make it through. For some of you, it feels like it's never gonna end. And I will not stand here and give you Christian easy answers to try to make you feel better. I wanna give you the one and only hope that truly exists for us. as you navigate the hardship and you navigate the darkness and you navigate all that it feels like the world is bringing against you. There's an invitation to you in the valley to seek him, to seek the Lord, to surrender it all over to Jesus, to place all of your trust in him and to make him your focus in the valley so that he can restore you, so that he can grow in you these roots that go deep and far, that help you withstand the hardship, that help you stand when everything comes against you, There's an invitation to intimacy in the darkness of the valley. And it's in the valley where things grow. So that nothing that we, that nothing we do and nothing that comes against us can tarnish or compromise the righteousness, that right relationship that comes from Jesus. Important thing to note about this passage, and I'm gonna, this is gonna gonna be part two next week. I know, I know, it's a lot, and it's heavy. I think a lot of us are there right now. 
It's a lot, and it's heavy, and you are trying to navigate it. But the important thing to note at the end of this passage, um, this passage, I mean, is it's written, it's a prophetic word that's written about the Messiah, okay? It's written about Jesus, and it's written in the context of his coming, that he's going to make all things new, that he's going to make things right. And ultimately, if you are here today and you have put your faith in Jesus, that you believe that he is the Messiah, that he is the one who came to save, and that you have put your trust in him, your hope, my hope, our hope, is in a coming king who will come and make all things right, who will take away the hurt and take away the pain, who will remove sickness and disease, who is in the process of restoration in this world even now. The first thing he wants to restore is you. He wants to be at work in you, restoring, redeeming, making you new, bringing hope, even in the valley. And so as we close out today, and if no one shows up next Sunday, I'll totally know why, because I already warned you where we're going. But this is real life, friends. This is real life. Everywhere you read in the Bible, you're gonna encounter real life. It's real life and we have to navigate it, but we don't have to navigate it alone. So as we close today, or as I close and we move into worship, There are probably some of you in this room that you are like walking through the darkest days of your life and you had people don't even know. You are surrounded by people but you feel alone. And maybe you've hit the darkest days, the darkest moments. And the invitation from Jesus today is you don't have to walk this valley alone. Meet me, meet me in the valley. I am in the valley with you, meet me, come meet me. Just surrender it to me, come meet me. I grow really good things in the valley and I wanna renew something in you. I wanna do something in you that will demonstrate who I am to you. Meet me in the valley. But you also don't have to do it alone. You don't have to feel alone in a room full of people because there are people here who can walk with you too. So um, uh, as the band comes, I'm just gonna invite you all to stand if you're able. And if this resonates with you today, if anything that I've said resonates with you today, where you are in your life, dark moments, trials, hardships, I wanna pray for you today. So I'm just gonna ask everybody in the room, just close your eyes. And if that is you today, 
that you are walking in the darkest days of your life and you feel alone and you feel overwhelmed or you have had hardship upon hardship upon hardship and it feels like it's never going to end and you're longing today is that Jesus would meet you in the valley. I'm just gonna ask you to shoot your hand up for a second. Just raise your hand for a minute. Thank you. I wanna pray for you and I wanna encourage you as I pray for you that you would open your heart to Jesus. You need to open your heart to him this morning that you would invite him to meet you in your valley right now in this moment today because that's where he is he's there so i'm going to pray god we um come before you today and we feel the weight and the heaviness of so many life situations that are going on right now in this room so many situations going on right now where people feel like they're stuck in the dark. They feel alone, they feel abandoned, they're frustrated. Like the darkness is never going to lift. And they've even questioned if you're there. And Lord, today in this moment, today in this moment, Lord, I pray that in their darkest, deepest valley, Lord, you would meet them there today. That they would open their hearts to you. They would surrender, trying to get out of it, trying to get over it, trying to get around it. And they would just be in the valley with you. They would put their trust and their faith in you. And they would allow you to grow something beautiful in them, that they would allow you to to grow deep, deep roots. That they would begin to actually flourish in the valley, God. Even if you never, even if they never make it out of the valley on this earth, that today they would be reminded that their hope is in heaven. Their hope is with you a God who makes all things new. And that today, Lord, they would be surrounded by your presence. They would be overwhelmed by your love and that they would just have this peace, your peace that would just come over them. So Lord, you promise to be in the valleys, to show up in the valleys. I pray that over every person who raised their hand today, that you will show up in their valley. Maybe their problems aren't gonna all be solved. But you're gonna begin a new thing in them. And it's gonna grow into something beautiful. I pray all these things in the strong and mighty name of Jesus. Amen.